gospel lesson today is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. The temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, We're going to get to the trailer in a second. Um, As you heard the choir piece, I don't know if you heard the the question about who am I as part of, uh, it's foundational to your spiritual life, by the way, to figure out who we are. And it's foundational to this movie, Who We Are. And um, in this movie, there's a sense in which the, the main character is struggling with identity. And I wonder as a way for you in a moment, just to think for yourself, if somebody said, who are you? What would you say? As an example, you might say, well, I'm a father, I'm a minister. Well, those are things I do, but who am I? Who are you? Who am I? And then I might come around and say, well, I try to, I'm a, somebody who tries to make connections. But I wonder if you just take uh, 15 seconds to think about how you'd answer that question, then maybe with the person beside you. Try not to do what you do, retired. No. Who are you as a person? Like, well, how would you describe yourself? And then share that, dare to share it with somebody near you. Beautiful conversation. Who are you? One or two words. So give you 15 seconds. Thank you. I hope that was okay. And if you just wanted to keep your answer to yourself, that's fine too. Who are you? Who am I? Changes lots in our life. And I'll invite us to see the official trailer for this film, Can You Ever Forgive Me?
Just these. I don't want the others. Come on, man. I slept these all the way here. There's people waiting. You know, you don't have to be so disrespectful. You've actually carried my books here. And you are? Lee Israel. Oh, we have copies of your latest work right over there. Nobody is going to pay for the writer Lee Israel right now. I'm months behind in my rent, and my cat is sick. It's four in the afternoon, and you're drunk. I'm hardly drunk. Craig, no problem. My suggestion to you is you go out there and you find another way to make a living. Recently found this delightful sign letter. Fanny Bryce, one of my favorites. I could give you 75. Oh, I could give more for better content. It's a bit bland is all. Yeah, I can definitely get a lot more for this one. I mean, the PS makes it priceless. Quite by accident, I find myself in a rather criminal position. What criminal activity could possibly involve it except a crime of fashion force? I'm embellishing literary letters by prominent writers. I love his writing. Particularly clever, don't you think? Caustic wit. <laughs> this is quite something. These are wonderful. I thought so, too. Name your price. You were looking at one month's rent. What are we going to do? Gamble? Shop? Drink? <laughs> Ms. Israel, I have a couple of questions regarding the last letter I purchased. Uh -oh. What seems to be the problem? People are on alert. Your name's been put on a list. On a list? They're literary treasures. One of a kind. It's my writing. You're impersonating other people. Nobody's buying Lee Israel letters. There have been some forgeries going around. Do you think it's real? Looks that way. Good. You're stealing from me? Come on. Get out of my house! That's just supposed to be something more than this. We're probably looking at some time behind bars. What? I can't say that I regret any of my actions. In many ways, this has been the best time of my life. How many people have seen this movie? of you. Uh, this, this is probably not, right, not the right way to do, but let's pray. <laughs> Music, song, silence, story. Probing, pushing, awakening us to who we truly are. We pause into that place and space today. Amen. My sermon today, as I finished it, felt like there was lots of parts and lots of questions, and I invite you to take the part and the question that works and chew on that this week. We begin Lent today, which the word Lent is about spring. It's about the breaking of the earth, the warming of the air, even in Calgary, plus nine this coming week. We are on the edge of transformation, just like the Lenten journey is an edge toward transformation in the 40 days leading up to Good Friday and to Easter. And so Lent is about spring. Lent is about that kind of transformation. And it began on Wednesday morning in this place at 7 a.m. when about 15 people gathered for silence and song and the imposition of ashes, or as I read this week, our mortality is li literally pushed in our face. We come from the ground, we return to the ground. We come from dust and we return to dust. We were here at seven in the morning, some uh, as the sun began to rise. And some came in the evening, uh, probably a gather of about 30, as in the same way we heard story and song and silence and ashes were forced upon those who were willing to their face to their forehead to look at our mortality. Reminded of our inevitable death, friends. Reminder that we come from the earth, we return to the earth, and nothing can separate us from that. Some people hate Lent. Some people think, oh, I'm gonna go to the United Church because they don't do Lent like my other church. I remember a woman who said to me, just the beginning of Lent said, I'll see you at Easter. She literally gave up Lent for Lent. <laughs> she said, I just don't do it. I don't like it. It's not for me. I'll see you at Easter. L lilies are what I do. 
I remember seeing her about 10 years later and I reminded her of that story. She said, yep, I haven't changed. I don't do Lent. I understand that some people Lent is just not the way they want to approach life. They perhaps don't want to look in the mirror. They don't like perhaps some of the chants that the minister throws at them or they don't like the idea of quiet. They want the raw. They want the raw, raw lilies. All is happy, bring on the Easter bunny. But I gotta tell you, not since my accident, but just in life, I really like Lent. You won't believe that. I like it. I love a small gathering with ashes placed on my forehead. I love Lent providing perspective for me to look honestly in the mirror at who I am and whose I am and how I've lived my life. I remember a minister colleague in the island telling me one day when he, as a minister, went for the imposition of ashes, he looked at his hands and he said to himself, these hands are already dirty. Looking at our hands and looking at our life is what Lent invites us to. There's extra attention in Lent to who we are, not in guilt, my friends, although guilt can be good, but in a sense of openness, looking at who we truly are, paying attention. And so Lent begins, as you heard a few moments ago, as Kathleen read the scripture that's read at your Catholic friends and your Presbyterian and Anglican and United Churches this morning, same text. It's about Lent beginning in the wilderness. There are two Lenten stories in the Bible. One is incredibly brief. It's two lines from Mark's gospel. I'll read them. We could have given them to Kathleen, but it's a little bit short for her to walk all the way from the back and then read this and then return. It says this, this is Mark's account, okay, listen up. And the Spirit immediately drove, drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. But the angels ministered to him. Amen. That's what Mark says. He's the shortest gospel, quickest story. You got to hear Luke, an expanded, redacted story with his own theology coming into play, several verses speaking about that same Lenten journey. But I love this story. Here's Jesus, by God's driving into the wilderness, a place where some might say is a question where Jesus had to wrestle, who am I now? Who am I going to be as the story of Jesus unfolds? And if you look at this story, you'll see that Jesus, it begins with him being hungry. It's at the end of the 40 days in Luke's gospel. He's hungry. And so Satan, which literally means Satan or the devil, it means adversary. Satan or devil is adversary. Now, who has not had or met Satan in their life? I have lots of adversaries. People who come before you, not with a tail and a fork, but those who step in your way. Those who are your adversaries is what Jesus encountered, if you will, in this story. Hang with me. So here he is, and he's tempted. You're hungry. How about a bit of food? Take that rock, turn it into bread. He says, no. Then he says, well, you could be powerful. He says, why don't you uh, look at all the kingdoms I've got. I've got the entire world at my hand. Which one do you want? You could, if you just follow me, be in charge of it all. Who hasn't been tempted with power? That doesn't work. Jesus says no, and then he takes him up to the highest pinnacle. And he says from the pinnacle, jump off here and save yourself, and you can have that kind of power, that kind of magic, and be all powerful. And Jesus says no. You could call this wilderness Jesus' test. Check, check, check. As he moves forward, beginning his ministry. Who here has not been tested at some point in your life by someone? Who among you here has not at some point had an adversary before you tempting you with the same kinds of power Jesus was invited to? I see this text as Jesus saying, here I am. I'm starting out, what do I do with what I got? What am I going to do with the power we all have? How are we going to live our life with what we've got and the living of our life? What's interesting to me in this text is that Jesus masters this temptation the first time, but I'm sure he's in the wilderness again and again. If you read the text, he goes to the lonely place, to the wilderness. But without a word of guilt or blame or shame, Jesus meets you and I where we are. You see, from that wilderness, Jesus goes out and meets Zacchaeus, the guy who was cooking the books, and has lunch with him. 
or the woman who's about to be stoned for adultery. He, he stops the crowd, and all you hear is the dropping of stones. And he says, anybody who's without sin, go ahead, throw the first stone. And recognition that all of us sin in some way. Or he stands with those who grieve, and he offers a word of hope and promise of life beyond death. Or when they're all out on the storm and the storm he sees, he calms the storm with simple words, these words, peace be still. Time after time, without guilt or blame or shame. How do we get Jesus as guilt, shame, and blame? My, we've messed up Jesus. He stands with you and I in our wilderness beside us as our advocate and our friend. Jesus was never about guilt and shame. The church has, and we need to confess that. But Lent poses the question, and this is that question, who are you, and what are you going to do with what you got? It's not about guilt. It's about answering that question like Jesus answered in the wilderness. Who am I, and what will I do? Anne and I had the wonderful opportunity of holding hands for an hour and a half this past week while we listened to Barack Obama Yes, we went. I had to. But here's what he said in a nutshell, for those of you who didn't get there, when he answered the question, who are we supposed to be? He said this, be kind, be useful. Could have saved myself a lot of money. (laughs) Isn't that a wonder? Think about the wisdom of that in life. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be kind, and we're supposed to be useful. Expand those words. Be kind and be useful. I wouldn't mind that as an epitaph. Maybe he's going to have it on his. Be kind, be useful. As he answers the Lenten question, who am I? Kind and useful. So what about this movie? This movie I've seen twice, which I recommend you to see. See movie twice. And you can see it and rent it for $5.99 on your computer. A great story of Lee Israel as she goes about her life and she comes to a writer's block where she is a nobody, where all of her writing is 75% off, where her agent is telling her, get out and promote yourself, get glitzy, come on, do something fancy. And she is just not able to do so. She's not doing well, her agent's not helping, she's not schmoozing, until she comes across a letter in a book. And she takes that letter into the store, as you saw, and says, what can you give me for that? And they say, well, it's good, but if it was a little bit fancier, you could get double the money. So what does she do but go and get a variety of typewriters so that she could then become various different authors? And it's quite a comical movie, if you believe it or not, where she begins to take on the identity of other people. What's interesting is she is a forger. Now, this is a little sidebar. Did you know that Paul, who's in your Bible... He wrote 11 letters, but he's attributed, biblical scholars will say, only seven are his. Your Bible has forgery in it. And I'm not being a goof when I say that. And I don't think it diminishes the value of those letters, trust me. Some of them are written by somebody else who wanted to say, this is what Paul meant, and stepped in to do that. We could have an evening and look at those. I remember taking a whole course 30 years ago on this. 30 years ago, this is the newfangled stuff. Somebody saying, I'm Paul, and this is what he really meant, and wrote and inserted into your Bible forged letters. Back to the movie. Interesting, isn't it? There's truth. It may not be fact, but there is truth. Anyway, he befriends Jack, who is uh, struggling himself. He's a gay guy. He's super funny. He also has a bit of a drinking problem. But they come together, the two of them, and they start to work together until the FBI finds out, as you saw, And then she has to come face to face with what she's done. And here's the confession in the movie. I'll invite us to watch it. It's just about a minute. It's the most real confession you'll ever hear. In many ways, this has been the best time of my life. (laughs) I mean, it's the only time recently that I can remember being proud of my work. But it wasn't really my work, was it? I mean, if I had put in my work, then I would have been opening myself up to criticism. 
And I'm too much of a coward to do that. I lost my cat. It's probably the only soul that truly loved me, maybe ever. And I lost my friend, who may have been an idiot, but he, he tolerated me. And it was nice to have around. And I think I have realized that I am not a real writer. And that I think in the end, it, I would say it was not worth it. I would say that. Uh, I will accept the judgment of the court as valid and fulfill whatever sentence I may receive with full understanding that I have earned said punishment. Lee Israel, the court sentences you to five years probation plus six months house arrest. You may only leave home to go to and from your place of employment, your work in the community, and to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. You are not to leave the state or consort with felons, and you are to pay restitution to your victims within your means. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a good thing. Very fair. Mm. That confession scene in the movie doesn't wreck the movie. But you see her truth, you see her looking in the mirror, her honesty. She was afraid that if she was real, she would hurt herself. In the movie, she talks about, and you, she goes about the movie, in the movie, putting up walls so that nobody touches her. Where she really doesn't have to relate, doesn't have to be real until she begins to forge these letters. And the confession begins her look in the mirror at who she truly, truly was. She answers the question, who am I, with her confession. Confession is a church word that's got a lot of bad rap. It's a good word. The word confession means with voice. Who among us doesn't need to with voice sometimes to confess where we messed up? Maybe to someone or even just in the silence of our own heart to name those things that we regret. It may be to a therapist or a clergy person or a friend or even a stranger, but confession is how we come clean with who we are. It is a Lenten word. The United Church Magazine, The Observer, had a beautiful story that I came across on confession about a minister who had all these degrees in church development, and the more degrees she got, the worse her church got as it began to fail, and they were blaming the leader for the church failing. And she went to a retreat with a friend, and I'll just read a paragraph here. She went to a retreat called Set Free. This church that was hosting was a very successful church. At one point, the organizers had us break off into groups of three. With the help of prompts on printed cards, we confessed our sins, our weaknesses, our mistakes, and our fears to each other, and we prayed for inner healing personal sharing of emotional vulnerability is not my usual thing. So when it came to my turn, I let someone else go. But the presence of two strangers who were also vulnerable and sworn to confidentiality was almost mystical. When I did speak, my hidden brokenness met the light before the witnesses, and God stepped in with unspeakable love and relieved me, released my tears and dried them again. Something happened in those small groups that changed the trajectory of my life and ministry. I felt less self-reliant and less self-righteous than any other time in my life, and I felt intimately and deeply and eternally loved. That's what confession does. 
confession is a church word that we need to reclaim as a word that says we all need that space and place. In the, eight, in the 90s, I worked in um, Don Jail in Toronto. This is a, a jail that you go to as soon as you're off the street waiting for your charge and your court date. And I remember meeting a guy because I worked with the Quakers then. And uh, I went and our job was just to sit and be amongst the prisoners. And I remember meeting Gerard. Gerard came over to me and he said, hey, you're a church guy. I know how to kill myself. You want me to show you? I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. He says, I'll show you. I said, you know what? All you have to do is take your shirt. And he took it off and he started to make a noose. And then he said, you know what? And then I realized I don't need to kill myself for what I've done. And he took his shirt and he went over into the chapel and he placed it at the foot of the cross. He said, there. I'm good with who I am and what I've done. And I'll be here and I'll pay my dues, but I am okay. I don't need to kill myself. Incredible wisdom, I say, from a guy who had to come to truth about who he was and remain here. So here's the piece about this movie that I love is this confession. Because it is not a movie that makes a nice bow on the end of the movie, trust me, it doesn't. Although at the end you see her cleaned up a little bit, you see an apartment that doesn't have dog poo or cat poo everywhere. You see a, you see a place that's tidy, you see the sun coming in, you see her before a computer now telling her story. Her story, not forging others' stories. She also has under the computer a kitten. The cat was the only soul that ever loved her, she said. And the cat has died because Jack messed up. She steps forward in transformation, bring another animal that she can connect with in her life. There's a sense of hope in this movie, a sense of hope that confession leads to that kind of life. So here's the, here's the homework for us. This movie, as we talked about on Monday night, asks the question, what's your wound? I'll put that up there. Everybody has a wound. Sometimes you got it yesterday, and sometimes you've been living with it for a long time. In her life, as she said, she, she wouldn't trust anyone. She couldn't trust anyone. She was just in her own world, unlovable, uh, unforgiven. Uh, uh, everything she just laid on herself, that was her wound. And then there's the question for me, what's mine? Well, I mean, I was sick. You know, my doctor was brilliant. He said, John, you have a hip. You aren't a hip. It's so important to get, friends. We all have a wound, but that doesn't define us. And so the work then became for me to heal from that and to trust. When I was a kid, I I was filled with lots of shame. I I was fearful. I didn't think I mattered. And there was a part of my work that was saying, I'm okay with who I am as I grow in my life and space. So the question for you is, as she did, she confesses her truth and she comes into herself. What's your wound? That's the next one is, what's your work? What is your work? We all have work to do. My work was, was beginning to accept who I was. My, my hip work was to get into the, the surgery and then the therapy. I'm 7.2 today to get better but ultimately to trust. And then the last part of this is, what's your way in the world? And she found her way at the end, saying, I'm gonna tell my story, that's her way. So the question I have for you and I to deal with, what's your wound? We all have them. What's the work? And what's your way? And Lent provides that kind of work. What's my work? Or what's my wound? What's my work? And what's my way? And and this movie invites you to to that. So here's the thing I'm going to invite you to. I'm not going to get you to talk to anybody. Don't worry. I'm going to say this, that Lent begins that invitation. What's my wound? What's my work? And what's my way? And just in a matter of one minute, Bruce is going to play, and you're just going to sit there and think about, well, what's my wound? What is the work I've got to do in Lent? And what's my way? One minute.
is our wound? What is our work? What is our way? Confession can be the way that we not look to a cosmic judge in the side sky or God like Santa Claus, but rather trust that God lives within you and I and all God can do is fall in love with you and I, forgive us and set us free. May we, all of us, find the way which is deep trust in the God who is love, and may it come alive in your life and mine. Thanks be to God. Amen.